All right, Masato, we are ready. Okay. So, okay, now participants uh, in. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for attending uh, Masonic Council Center seminar series today. And uh, this year's first seminar is, uh, will be uh, given by Dr. Anya Berinsky. And uh, she is known as, you know, known as the um, co-leader of a genetic mechanism and also uh, in charge of uh, shared, uh, shared resources of cancer center. And uh, let me actually you know, introduce her briefly. So uh, she has got her uh, BS and PhD degree from uh, Heinrich Hein University, Dusseldorf, Germany. And after that, that she came to the United States Brown University and uh, continued her research work, uh, started as a post, uh, postdoctoral fellow. Now she's a professor of uh, uh, University of Minnesota. And also she is associate, associate dean for fundamental science for University of Minnesota Medical School. And uh, uh, she is known as uh, you know, one of the world leader of a DNA repair and its co uh, correlation to the diseases. So uh, I don't want to suck up her time, just uh, you know that I will you know, let her to start speaking. So please take it away. Okay, thank you Masado for the kind introduction. Um, happy semester start everybody. Thank you for being here. I can't see anybody and I also don't have a chat function on my screen. So, but we talked to Masado and Sandy. If you have questions during my talk, please just um, uh, uh, raise your hand and they will call on, on you and me and we can interrupt and I'd be happy to take questions. So it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I don't know, it's been ages uh, since I've given a seminar last year in the uh, Masonic Cancer Center. So I'm excited to talk to you about some of the recent work that we've been doing. And it really has been focusing on this under replication problem. So First, I'd like to take the opportunity to give a big, huge shout out to my lab members. Um, they are just uh, the most fantastic group to work with and they have been troopers and supporters throughout this ongoing pandemic. And it's just been an absolute pleasure um, to work with them. So if you're there, thank you all very much. All right. So Many of you know that we are very interested in DNA replication, and I want to give you a brief overview of how that process is controlled. As you are aware, DNA replication is tightly controlled by the cell cycle. And what happens in G1 phase is a process called origin licensing. So replication origins, there are tens of thousands in the genome of human cells don't have really consensus sequences. Um, some of them have epigenetic marks that attract this um, factor, the origin recognition complex to bind to a site on the DNA and then recruit some helpers, CDT1 and CDC6, and together this complex forms a loading complex for the double hexameric helicase, the mini chromosome maintenance 227 complex. And um, it needs to be um, clasping onto the DNA and needs a specialized loader. But once it's stably and correctly oriented on the DNA, we call this a licensed origin. And then as the cell transitions into S phase and S phase specific cycle independent kinase activity phosphorylates multiple targets here with which I haven't shown, um, this uh, MCM227 requires several cofactors um, such as CDC45 and GINs to really become an active helicase. And lastly, one of my favorite proteins, MCM10, is required 
to initiate origin firing. And that's, um, that's a process that um, occurs throughout S phase. And then these replication forks, as we call them, um, bypass each other and proceed bidirectionally. And so this is then DNA elongation in S phase. So accurate DNA replication is really your best bet to maintain a stable genome. And here again, the bird's eye view with the MCM227 um, loaded onto, onto DNA um, during G1. And uh, one thing that I wanna point out is that human cells load a lot more MCMs than they actually need. So only a, um, part of them shown here in green. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Shown here in green is actually activated at the onset of S phase. And the rest of these um, complexes are so called backup origins. And then during elongation, they um, proceed bidirectionally, as I said earlier. And I also mentioned MCM10 um, as an essential firing factor. So it really, the number of repli active replication forks that we have in our cells really is determined by the number of origins that get licensed and ultimately by the activity of MCM10 and how many of these licensed origins are truly activated. So how do we know this? How do we measure licensing and uh, DNA um, incorporation? We have used a method in the past few years that's called quantitative flow cytometry, and it really allows a single cell analysis of um, cell cycle progression and DNA replication. And what you're doing uh, in this essay is to stain total DNA by DAPI. You monitor DNA synthesis by um, a nucleoside analog um, EDU or ethanyl um, deoxyuridine. And you can monitor origin licensing with an antibody against one of the subunits of the MCM227 complex, and we use MCM2. And so what you see in these uh, resulting uh, facts, uh, graphs, is um, a population here in G1 shown in blue. And what we're monitoring here is the loading of MCM2. And then these cells go into S phase and become doubly positive for MCM2 and for EDU. And once they um, complete DNA replication, they are doubly um, negative. Um, they, they have the, no longer MCMs on their, on their chromatin and they do not incorporate EDU. So MCM10, I told you, is required for origin firing. And uh, we, we showed recently that MCM10 mutant cells have a DNA synthesis defect using this quantitative flow cytometry. And you can see here in, in wild type cells compared to do two different heterozygous MCM10 mutants in um, HCT116. And there is, as expected, no difference in these cells when we look at MCM2 loading. So licensing is not defective. Um, it's all the same. Um, but when you look at the incorporation of the, uh, of the EDU uh, nucleoside analog, then you see that that is uh, severely compromised in the mutants compared to wild type. And so this is what we call under replication. And I've told you this because this is really how we get um, started on uh, thinking about under replication. So what happens in, in these MCM10 mutants is that uh, replication forks stall in what we in the field call hard to replicate regions. And those are regions such as chromosomal fragile sites that have very little um, replication um, origins to begin with, or highly repetitive regions such as telomeres. Um, and replication uh, forks just get stuck. 
and then um, DNA synthesis uh, halts. And so that's shown here by this red complex. So what really happens um, with this under-replicated DNA? And I'm showing you here a scenario where we have a so-called double fork stalling. So this is a stalled replication fork. This is a stalled replication fork. And the DNA in between is, as of now, not getting replicated. Excuse me. <clears throat> So when you tear this apart and look at the two sister chromatids in this complex here, then you see that both of them have very large single-stranded gaps. And this is highly cancer relevant because most cancer cells, and I think it's at the order of like 30 to 50% of cancers have a dysfunctional G1 to S transition. And that means that um, very often the RB pathway is, uh, is mutated and these cells make a lot of E2F, they produce um, subsequently a lot of cyclin E, and that pushes cells prematurely into S phase. And I say prematurely because they haven't really completed all the replication licensing. And what's happening de facto to these cells is that they have a shorter G1 phase, and that translates into fewer replication complexes that can duplicate your DNA. So, under-replication is very common in cancer cells. And as you can imagine, <clears throat> if this chromosome enters mitosis, then that's highly problematic. And um, two of the main pathways that, uh, that, that, that follow this under-replication are either anaphase problems. So these sister chromatids cannot properly separate it because um, they are still entangled together and that causes often uh, lagging chromosomes, or this region will just break um, and then will be encapsulated by a protein oligomer that's called 53 binding protein one, and it will form nuclear bodies that carry this under-replicated DNA through mitosis into the next G1 phase where it's then been um, repaired. So there are several pathways that can actually fill single-stranded gaps as they occur. And the first one that I want to introduce you to um, acts in S phase and is um, catalyzed by an enzyme called primase polymerase. So this is a uh, primase that's not the, uh, the uh, canonical proofreading primase that acts during normal replication, but it can be recruited to DNA to these gaps and it will start anywhere within the gaps to restart DNA replication. The problem is that it never extends the existing DNA, but um, de novo primes. And so there are single-stranded gaps associated with this process. And because it doesn't have any proofreading activity, it's a mutagenic process. But this is um, a process that happens in S phase. Then another um, pathway that is active somewhat in S phase, but mostly post-replication in G2 phase is translesion synthesis. And classical um, TLS, is dependent on the ubiquitination of PCNA at a highly um, conserved residue, lysine 164, and this activates so-called translesion polymerases. And just like Primpol, these polymerases don't have proofreading activity, but they can um, read through any kind of lesion or they can just um, extend uh, DNA and help uh, to restart replication forks. And the third pathway, and again, because this doesn't have proofreading activity, it's also a mutagenic process. And the third pathway 
happens actually in mitosis. And I don't know whether Naoko Shima is here, but Naoko is um, one of the co-discoverers of this um, pathway, MIDAS, mitotic DNA synthesis. So we all learned that DNA synthesis only occurs in uh, S phase. That turns out not to be the case. MIDAS is a repair synthesis pathway. So this has nothing to do with the um, semi-continuous uh, um, DNA uh, replication mechanism that happens during S phase, but nonetheless, uh, it uses some of the same enzymes and it synthesizes DNA in mitosis. And this pathway entails the um, introduction of a double-stranded break and then the closing of the gap. And it is also a mutagenic process. Okay, so there are several ways to take care of gaps um, and I want to stick a little bit with the uh, PCNA dependent pathways. That's what we have spent a lot of energy on in the last um, five years. There are two different sub pathways and these uh, are um, collectively uh, called DNA damage tolerance pathways because they are not truly repair pathways, but they are just tolerating damage or a lesion that can be in the template DNA. And that's shown here by this red triangle. So a normal replication fork would stall at this triangle. And uh, what happens is that with the, with the polymerase PCNA stalls and PCNA is ubiquitinated by RAD18 and RAD6 and then recruits a translucent polymerase and this polymerase can just replicate across the lesion without any problem. It has a very large um, nucleotide binding site. And this is, as I said earlier, an error-prone process. There is another sub-pathway that is error-free and that's uh, somewhat reminiscent and uses the machinery of homology, uh, homologous recombination. And um, this is true DNA acrobatics here. So when the polymerase um, reaches this, this lesion and, and halts, what is initiated through the ubiquitination of PCNA is a template switch pathway where this DNA no longer uses this parental strand as a template, but goes on over to the nascent DNA and uses that as a template, replicates over the area where this lesion occurs and then switches back. So this is rather complicated, but it's a, it's a very interesting and intriguing pathway and it's error-free. So why am I telling you about uh, DNA gaps and, and uh, all these pathways that can fill them up? Uh, so there are some very recent, really exciting papers, uh, primarily out of Sharon Cantor's lab, um, that, that support the notion that DNA gaps are actually an intrinsic vulnerability of BRCA deficient cells. And the model here is that during DNA replication in BRCA1 and 2 deficient cells, there is an accumulation of damaged DNA. So there's an accumulation of these under-replicated DNA gaps. And these are counteracted by the very pathways that I just um, talked about. And one of them is translucent synthesis to fill them. And this enables um, complete DNA replication and restores the fitness um, of a normal cell. And so uh, of, of a BRCA1-2 deficient cell, as long as this pathway is active, but um, one of these papers here published in Science Advances um, describes the uh, development of a new TLS inhibitor. And so this is uh, something very exciting that um, I think is currently in phase one trials for um, BRCA2 and uh, one and two deficient cancers. 
Okay, so this intrinsic vulnerability is quite different from the paradigm that we know um, about the BRCA, BRCA and PARB1 synthetic lethality. And just to remind you, PARB inhibitors are used to block sporadic single-stranded breaks in the genome of BRCA deficient cells. And during DNA replication, those single-stranded breaks are then being converted into double-stranded breaks. And because the cells are HR deficient, they cannot repair the damaged DNA, and this results in low fitness. So what we were interested in is the question whether, whether um, TLS plays a role in PARP inhibitor resistance. And so what Wendy Long, a former graduate student in the lab did was to generate um, PCNA K164R mutant cell lines that are unable to perform TLS and the template switching pathway. And we collaborated with Lucian Moldovan's lab at Penn State. And um, Wendy created um, mutants in, in HTERT RPE cells and in HCT116 and Lucian's lab um, generated uh, mutant 293T cells. And the first surprise um, we got was that in HCT116 cells, we were unable to introduce the um, homozygous mutation. So we were only able to, uh, uh, to, to obtain heterozygous K164R mutants. So that would suggest that in a transformed uh, cell, this pathway is essential. And so for the remainder of the experiments that I'm showing you here, we used RPE and the 293T cells. So the first thing uh, Wendy did was to make sure that the mutation really abolished PCNA ubiquitination. And we usually do that by exposing cells to UV radiation. Uh, you get a, a normally a um, solid ubiquitination signal. This is all the chromatin fraction and you see here PCNA and this is the ubiquitinated form of PCNA. Um, and in the mutants, we don't see any modification here. We also confirmed this with a ubiquitin specific um, antibody that recognizes the modification at K164 and there is nothing in these mutant cell lines. And um, we were not completely surprised to see that these mutants accumulate endogenous uh, DNA damage or suffer from, from replication stress. And that's shown here. When you look at the untreated mutants, they have um, RPA phosphorylated um, at a residue that's recognized by the checkpoint kinase ATR, and that's a indication of replication stress. And then most of you are, I think, familiar with gamma H2AX as a marker for double strand breaks. And although we don't see that in the uh, untreated mutant after UV treatment, we see it earlier appearing than in the wild type cells. And when we looked at the fax profile of these cells, we also see consistent with the uh, DNA damage markers that I've shown you here, that the cells have a modest accumulation in G2. So you can see here, there is, it jumps from 16 to 22, 25% uh, in the mutants. So those um, results are all consistent with endogenous uh, damage accumulating in these cells. I told you that um, under-replicated and broken DNA is packaged into 53 BP1 nuclear bodies. So we looked at the occurrence of these markers um, in our um, mutants, either in the non-treated conditions or after treatment with ophidicolin, ophidicolin is a replication polymerase inhibitor. 
So it should um, lead to underreplication in wild type cells, which you can see here. I hope you can see the little dots here. And we are looking at cyclin A negative cells, so cells that are not in S phase. Um, for, for these markers. And you can see in the mutant, unlike the wild type cells, the mutant accumulate 53 BP1 nuclear bodies, um, even under untreated conditions. And they do it to such a large extent on the right here is the quantification of um, several experiments. And so in red, are the mutants and blue is wild type. And you see even the treatment with the replication inhibitor doesn't increase um, the 50, 53 BP1 nuclear bodies anymore in the mutants. So they already are at a pretty high threshold. So to address the question now, whether TLS inhibition or the um, general uh, um, inhibition of PCNA uh, ubiquitination at K164 <clears throat> contributes in any way to um, olaparib um, resistance, we used 293 T cells. And we're comparing here in blue the wild type cells, and in red the K164 are mutants, just as KR. And those are um, SI treated control cells. And then we deplete BRCA1 or BRCA2 and look at olaparib resistance. And you see that the mutants, in and of itself, are not more olaparib sensitive than wild type cells, but in combination with the knockdown of BRCA1 and BRCA2, they are significantly more sensitive to the drug. And to show that this is not just specific for um, the 293T mutants, we also used HeLa cells um, that had a knockout for BRCA2 and we depleted RAD18 the enzyme, the E3 ubiquitin ligase that ubiquitinates PCNA at K164R, and we basically get the same results. So what we conclude um, from this is that indeed um, PCNA K164 mediated gap filling provides resistance um, against PARB inhibitors. And this low fitness of the cells is counteracted by the activation of these pathways. Um, there are several cancer uh, models in which we do see a highly upregulated ubiquitination um, response. Um, but <clears throat> further investigation by Wendy um, led us to conclude that MIDAS might also play a role in counteracting this fitness. And I will show you some data that um, support the notion that MIDAS is controlled um, by PCNA K164 ubiquitination. And so if we lose that in our mutants, then MIDAS is uh, inhibited. And MIDAS uh, is, is a process that, um, uh, to the credit of Naoko, uh, uh, is dependent on FANC-D2 and an endonuclease. So MIDAS is a repair pathway that's slightly different regulated in cancer cells and in, in uh, normal cells. In untransformed cells, it's highly dependent on D2. And in transformed cells, it's codependent on D2 and RAD51. And I'm showing RAD51 not here in this uh, in the scheme. But what MIDAS is essentially is a break-induced replication pathway that restores um, the, the second copy of this uh, of this uh, parental DNA by invading <coughs> the, the uh, double strand, the sister double strand, and then using the other copy um, 
as a template. So, and, and that's where you need the double stranded break here um, to in, invade the strand and then synthesize along this template. And this allows you to complete DNA replication at a very, very late state in the cell cycle in mitosis. And so we looked at the ability of RAD18 mutants and PCNA mutants and also double mutants to perform um, MIDAS. And the way that we do that is to look at FANCD2 foci and at co-localizing EDU foci. And you can see here, this is one example um, image of, of wild type cells and PCNA mutants. And we specifically look at cells that have phosphorylated histone H3 at serine uh, 10, that's a mitotic marker. And you see in the PCNA um, mutant, we see still some residual FANCD2 foci, but we really don't see any um, EDU incorporation. And so that's quantified here. And we've done that, as I said, also for RAD18 mutants to make sure that it's really the ubiquitination and not another modification that occurs at K164 that regulates this process. And um, we're looking at both FANCD2 and EDU fo foci, and both of them are reduced in all of these mutants. So the reason, uh, we, we really don't understand the molecular mechanism, but we think it's linked to the inability to ubiquitinate FANCD2. Um, FANCT2 is sitting here at these junctions, at these uh, stalled forks. And in order to really hold on to the DNA and bind tightly, it is in a complex in, uh, with uh, FANGI and it needs to be ubiquitinated. And all of the mutants, as you can see here, are unable to um, completely ubiquitinate FANCD2. So we think the molecular defect in MIDAS is linked to this. And now we're, of course, very interested in trying to figure out um, how PCNA ubiquitination and FANCD2 ubiquitination um, affect each other and what the re molecular relationship is between those pathways. But what we, what we conclude um, is that PCNA ubiquitination does not only play a role in this classic TLS gap filling pathway, but is also critical for this other gap filling pathway that is active in mitosis, um, MIDAS to occur. So PCNA ubiquitination is an important player, we think, in both of these pathways. So for the remainder of the talk, I would like to spend some time to explore the question, why do BRCA deficient cells accumulate gaps in the first place? So this was pretty surprising, um, at least to the uh, replication community. Um, and we really don't understand why these cells would um, accumulate uh, gaps and have a profound underreplication phenotype. So and I want to go back um, about five years when uh, Ryan Bexley in my lab and I looked at the uh, cancer genome atlas and found that MCM10 and BRCA1 and 2 and PELB2, the um, uh, uh, partner and localizer for, for BRCA2, um, that alterations in all of those genes are actually mutually exclusive. And this is data here from breast invasive carcinoma. Um, and we, we never uh, really understood why this was the case, but what it really suggested is that there is some pathway <laughs> in replication coupled repair that would probably be co-regulated or needed the interaction between MCM10 and the BRCA2 um, complex. 
And so we've spent a lot of time uh, in the lab, or I, I did during my career, to work on MCM10. And um, MCM10 is, a, is an interesting uh, protein in the sense that it's part of the replication fork and it doesn't really have an enzymatic function. It catalyzes origin firing, but it does it in a physical uh, way. And it is a um, DNA binding scaffold. And we have, uh, together with Brent Eichmann's lab at, at Vanderbilt, spent a lot of time trying to um, determine the structure of the uh, conserved domains in MCM10. And in the N terminus, there is a coiled coil structure that promotes the oligomerization um, of the protein. And in the middle portion or internal domain, is a typical DNA binding motif, a so-called oligo, oligonucleotide, oligosaccharide binding fold or an OB fold in combination with a zinc finger. That's a, a very typical combination for DNA binding proteins. And within this domain is also a binding site for PCNA and a binding motif um, for polymerase alpha. And so I think it, it's um, um, evident how MCM10 sits at the fork and then really connects with other proteins that are required for replication. And early on, we, we gave it the nickname, the chief coordinator, um, because it really interacts with a multitude of replication factors and is probably helping to coordinate their action. And the C-terminal domain has a conserved winged helix motif and then a zinc finger that connects um, to DNA. So this is another DNA binding motif and a so-called zinc ribbon, which um, helps to connect it to the MCM227 complex. So knowing about this um, uh, mutual exclusivity with the uh, 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 mutations and alterations in MCM10 and PELB2 and BRCA2, we were delighted when we got a phone call um, a few years ago from Bing Jia's lab at uh, the University of Rochester. And he is um, the discoverer of PELB2 and he did a PELB2 pull down and called me up because he identified MCM10 in his pull, uh, in his pull down. So just to give you um, a brief refresher on BRCA1, BRCA2 and PELB2, um, here's a, a cartoon of a double strand uh, break that activates ATM, ATM then in turn um, phosphorylates PELB2, <coughs> PELB2 binds to BRCA2, um, BRCA1 is uh, recruited to the break um, in, in a separate pathway, but on the DNA, these proteins then come together and PELB2 connects BRCA1 and BRCA2 function. And BRCA2 then, of course, is known to um, evict RPA from DNA and load the DNA with RAD51 that then can promote the invasion of the sister chromatid to promote homologous recombination. And so all the important um, known binding partners of PELB2 were pulled down in, in this experiment. We see here um, BRCA2, BRCA1, KEEP1, um, BART1, the binding partner of BRCA1, RAD51, and also MCM10. And so MCM10 seems to be in a, in a complex with BRCA2 in, and PELB2. And importantly, this interaction is not dependent on DNA. So if you, if you digest the DNA away, um, you still see the two proteins interact um, perfectly fine. And I told you MCM10 has a coiled coil motif and um, it's known that PELB2 actually also has a motif like that and, and that is used to interact with BRCA2. 
and so um, it was uh, it was not uh, too far fetched to kind of try to dissect this motif and see whether it contributes to the interaction um, with Braca two. And what I'm showing you here is um, Braca two uh, is an MCM ten pull down, and we're looking for Braca two. And this is MCM10 wild type. This is a mutant that lacks the entire coiled coil motif here. And those are mutants um, that have various um, conserved residues like these um, um, lysines um, mutated in, leucine, sorry, mutated uh, in, in this domain. And, uh, I told you that MCM10 oligomerizes. And so one of these mutants, the MCM10 2A mutant, uh, still oligomerizes with itself. But as you can see here, it doesn't bind to uh, BRCA2. And so this was really a key mutant to distinguish between cellular defects that might be caused by the um, by preventing MCM10 to interact with itself or by preventing it to interact with BRCA2. So Bing's um, lab used a, a wonderful technique that we are also extremely fond of and that is called DNA combing. And what you do here is you stretch out DNA fibers um, and that's what you see here in blue. And some of these are labeled. And so the cells are being um, labeled when they are replicating in the Petri dish. And we usually use two consecutive um, nucleoside analogs to, to label and track replication. And the first one here in, in red is chlorodeoxyuridine, and the second one is iododeoxyuridine. And we incubate cells usually for 20 or 30 minutes with one label, and then wash this out, and then at the next label for the same amount of time. And then these cells are being captured in agarose plugs, and then the agarose is melted, and the DNA is extracted onto a small um, coated cover slip and is stretched out uniformly so that you have um, the same, the same um, basically stretching factor um, for, for all of these chromatin fibers. And it gives you these beautiful images then when you uh, use antibodies against the nucleosides and you can track replication and you can measure the fibers and you can basically calculate how fast your replication fork is incorporating nucleotides. And so that's what was done here in, uh, in this particular experiment. Measured was fork progression by measuring the different labels um, here. So the red one is first. So the way that this fiber was replicated was in, in this direction to the, lab, uh, to the left, um, red is replicated first and then uh, the replication fork incorporates um, the green dye. And so we measure uh, this. And what, what is compared here are wild type cells or cells that carry a mutation in the cold coil domain of MCM10 um, or cells that carry a mutation that uh, still restores MCM10 self-interaction, but disrupts interaction with BRCA2. And this was done in the presence and absence of bleomycin. Bleomycin is a drug that induces double-stranded breaks. Um, and what you see here is that the wild-type cells stop replicating under these conditions, or replication for progression is, is uh, really largely reduced. But the mutant cells that are not able, um, in which MCM10 is not able to interact with, with BRCA2, they still synthesize. Okay. And so this was a puzzle. And so um, Bing's lab had done 
um, a lot to understand the relationship um, of, of BRCA2 and uh, this enzyme that I told you about, Primpol, which is a gap filling uh, enzyme. And the data is a little bit complicated. So I will, I will give you um, the, the, the cartoon version first, but what we think is happening and where these single stranded gaps in BRCA2 deficient cells are coming from is uh, from replication forks that are unable to recruit BRCA2 to prevent Primpol coming to the fork and promoting DNA synthesis. Okay, so I will lead you through this step by step. This is a replication fork. You see here a DNA lesion. And I told you the forks, the polymerases are usually stopping at the DNA lesions. And that's shown here. The MCM2 to 7 helicase can um, traverse through this lesion and will continue to uh, unwind the DNA. And what um, results in the scenario is a gap, I'm losing my cursor, is, is a gap here that is coded by the single strand binding protein RPA, right? So this gap can now be filled by Primpol, but usually BRCA2 um, that's recruited by MCM10 prevents Primpol from acting on this gap because there are better pathways to fill it. Um, classic translation synthesis through um, PCNA ubiquitination is a preferred pathway because it doesn't leave any little gaps behind. And so in the absence of BRCA2 now, or in the absence of the interaction, um, with MCM10, Primpol just starts priming and starts new DNA synthesis here. And one advantage is that the large gap is filled, but it leaves behind these little gaps. And that's exactly what we think is the source for the DNA gaps in BRCA2 um, cells. So the experimental um, data is uh, here on, on the bottom. And this again is a DNA combing experiment. And we're comparing wild type cells without Primpol and mutant cells, uh, MCM10 mutants with or without Primpol. And without any DNA damage, you really don't see any kind of difference. But now when we... Um, uh, expose the cells to uh, 10 gray or, or, or a lower dose of um, irradiation, then you see differences occurring between wild type and, and mutant cell lines. And the wild type cells reduce polymerase, uh, polymerization of DNA. Um, and that's regardless of whether they have Primpol or not. And the mutants, they keep replicating. And this replication is Primpol dependent because you prevent it when you um, use an siRNA against the enzyme. Okay? And that's true for the higher dose of um, IR and the lower dose of IR. So in conclusion, we believe that BRCA2 that's recruited through sorry, MCM10. Hmm. I'm having trouble. Okay, sorry, that was my that was my Apple Watch. So, in conclusion, we believe that uh, MCM10 recruits BRCA2 to the replication fork uh, when you have gaps um, to prevent the action of Primpol because Primpol is mutagenic and it leaves these small single-stranded gaps by itself. So that concludes um, all the data that I wanted to show you this morning. Um, let me just summarize. I told you that dysregulation of the G1S transition can cause reduction in origin licensing, resulting in underreplication. DNA gaps can be filled by three different pathways, Primpol, TLS, and MIDAS. All of them are mutagenic. 
But I think understanding these pathways will really help us to devise new therapeutic um, pathways, uh, especially for uh, BRCA2 deficient cancers. I showed you that BRCA2 deficient cells accumulate, accumulate gaps um, because PRIMPOL activity is uncontrolled. And this can be therapeutically exploited by TLS inhibitor. So these BRCA2 deficient cells heavily rely on PCNA ubiquitination mediated pathway, pathways to, to fill the gaps. And so if you inhibit that branch, then that lowers the fitness of these cells and would probably enhance um, or laboratory treatment as well. And so both TLS and MIDAS uh, are dependent on PCNA K164 ubiquitination um, by the E3 ubiquitin ligase RAD18, and both pathways seem to enhance olaparib resistance. So I want to close here. Uh, needless to say, I would be happy to team up with um, with other members in the Cancer Center that are uh, looking um, uh, at, uh, at these pathways and trying to explore whether, whether we see upregulation of um, DNA damage tolerance or MIDAS in um, cells that become olaparib resistant. So I want to thank my lab again. Um, a shout out to Wendy Lung, a former graduate student who did most of the work on the K164R mutants and uh, other people who are uh, listed here in bold are um, uh, contributed to this project. Wendy is now a postdoc in Lisao's lab at, at MGH. And um, I wanna thank collaborators. Many thanks to Naoko Shima um, for our insight and uh, turning us on to uh, mitotic DNA uh, synthesis. And uh, Lucian at Penn State, um, Cook Lab at UNC, and Bing Jia's lab at the University of Rochester. And um, I love my lab because this is really the motto. Um, they are extremely supportive and help each other. And uh, these images are actually taken from Uptown um, shortly after the uh, George Floyd murder. Um, all the pile wood was. Um, um, you know, uh, was drawn on and I took pictures of that. And because yesterday was MLK day, um, don't be silent about things that matter. Um, with that, I wanna close and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Anya. Uh, please use a right hand function or use chat to, uh, to ask a question to Anya. So, May I ask a kind of a really naive question? Yes. Uh, to fill the gap, actually. Sure, sure. Yeah. Actually, the, I have a long term, long time actually, a question about why the mutation happens for the, for example, long uh, autosomal, auto, autosomal dominant diseases. Like uh, some genes, you know, like uh, for example, NF1 has an autosomal dominant that have a one per 3,000, you know, the possibility to get the, you know, the disease, then is it because actually, you know, just uh, as you said, the difficult to move the complex ahead or due to the, some other mutations are more lethal for the embryo? <laughs> um, I don't know. So I think from a sales <laughs> perspective, from, from a, it's a good question, Masado. And if I understand it correctly, I think from a sales perspective, it's, better to have a mutation than to have a double strand break, right? And mm -hmm. a stalled replication fork that cannot be restarted will be processed into a double strand break. And that's bad, 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 right? And so there, that's why we have all these mutagenic pathways that are helping to restart forks and to fill in gaps, just because I think the, it, it's better to have a complete copy of your genome, even if it has some mutations, 
and in an evolutionary sense, right, you, you want to evolve, you want to include a low level of mutations during every round of DNA replication. But I think that is the primary reason. Okay, understood. So there is one hand rising, uh, which is uh, Ilana. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Berinsky, it's really exciting. My question is about similar and different function of BRCA1 versus BRCA2, because you were talking about BRCA2 deficiency, right. which show this under replicated DNA, and they have similar, but they also have different function. Do you think BRCA1 can help in BRCA2 division cells and at least to fulfill some of BRCA2 functions? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we have been in other experiments that I haven't shown you, you know, we've, we are trying to isolate replication forks and then, then do mass spec on them. And what we always see, um, and we stall those forks, what we always see is that um, BRCA1 is there before BRCA2. And then BRCA1 um, is also part of three different complexes. So it's getting, it's, it's getting very complex, uh, very fast. I don't know um, how well, I mean, the main function of BRCA2 is really to load RAD51 onto DNA. And I don't know the field well enough to know whether BRCA1 has any of that ability. Okay. And in regard to this uh, function, BRCA2 deficient cells so this under-replicated DNA. So yeah. in this case, if you suspect what well, maybe you have under-replication, what the first uh, number of assays you will do because of this the regular cell cycle, you are not going to see much difference, yes? Yeah, so there are ways that you can, I didn't, um, I, I didn't add the experiment, but there are ways by DNA combing that you can physically show um, that there are gaps and you can use an enzyme S1 nuclease that will target single stranded gaps and will digest them. And essentially what you can see then in your DNA is that you have uh, shorter tracks. Okay, so when you look at these um, red and green uh, chromosomal fibers, after treatment with S1 nuclease, um, when you have truly gaps in your DNA, then you will see that your fibers are getting shorter. So there are ways to um, directly visualize that. Thank you. There are two more questions. One is from Dag. Yeah. Uh, can you speak up? I think. Uh... Doug, do you... can you speak? I think no. I think no. that you can read the question, Masato. OK. Then uh, it says, uh, do you think it makes a difference if the mutations in Bulluka are jam line versus somatic when implementing uh, implementing these uh, these other mechanisms, like uh, you know, the difference between you know somatic yeah. versus you know germline makes a difference. Right. Probably it's about uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, synthetic clearity, right? Right, right. I think it is you know it really depends on the mutation, on the actual mutation, um, and and not so much whether it was in the germline or not. If you have a germline mutation, that means that you're, um, you know, accumulating a lot more other mutations. So I think it's 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 kind of hard to compare. So you might not just have HR deficiency; you might have that compounded with a lot of other um, repair deficiencies as well. But you know, in essence, I think it depends on the nature of the mutation. Okay, the other question is from Lola. The yeah. Naive question. What role does uh, NHEJ plays, if any, or any in the under replication phenotype? Yeah. 
So um, that's an interesting question. So NHEJ, right, there is this, um, what we call DNA repair, double, double strand DNA repair pathway choice. And it's this battle between homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining. And as long as you have a sister chromatid, then homologous recombination is your preferred pathway. And um, there are ways to um, activate it in S phase and G2. This protein 53BP1 that I was talking about, um, if that gets onto the DNA before um, BRCA, uh, complexes or before any endonuclease can um, re resect the break, uh, then you channel the, the break into the non-homologous end joining pathway. Um, we, haven't, we haven't looked whether, um, you know, whether ligase 4 or other pathway components of non-homologous end joining um, alleviate uh, th this underreplicated DNA. Um, what happens to the 53BP1 nuclear bodies is that they get resolved in G1 and not by non-homologous end joining, but rather by a pathway that is very similar to the MIDAS pathway um, that, in, um, uh, that triggers uh, break-induced replication. So there are slight differences in repair, but the short answer is it's it's not known. Okay. So thank you very much, Anya, for the, oh, okay. It's uh, all answered, right? Okay. Thank you very much, Anya, for a great presentation. And uh, uh, I would like to respect you for everybody's time. So just uh, please have a really nice day today. And uh, yeah. please, you know, the, be careful for the COVID still. So then uh, I hope everyone will have a good year in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Masato. Bye-bye.